Amen. So this evening we're continuing the fourth sermon in the sermon series of the offerings. So we've gone through the first um, three um, offerings listed in Leviticus 1, 2, and 3. And tonight we're looking at the fourth, which is this offering of the sin offering. Now this is kind of a change in gears here. Um, and it seems kind of complicated as we go through the whole chapter of Leviticus chapter 4, and it talks a little bit more about it in Leviticus chapter 5. But basically, I want to break this down for you tonight to, so you can understand, you know, why this is different, this offering is different. I'm not going to go through the details of the blood and the pictures of Christ and all those things as I've gone through in the past. But the sin offering is a very specific offering, and the trespass offering coming up next week is also similar in this sense, that it is done to, um, to gain forgiveness for a specific thing that has been done wrong, okay? Now, a couple of things I want to point out before we get into um, the main points that I want to make tonight. There's one main point that I want you to take away from this tonight, but a couple of things um, to, to note before we get into that. First of all is this. If you notice a pattern in Leviticus chapter 4 that we just read, we go through uh, who is making the sin offering. It goes through a priest that is making a sin offering, and it talks about a priest that has sinned, and then it talks about um, the congregation that has sinned. This is, uh, you know, um, like um, Achan's, like the, Achan took the accursed thing, but the congregation did not know. So as they went into the battle at Ai, after Jericho, Achan, he took something, he took spoil, and, you know, the whole congregation suffered for that, but they didn't know about it. It was through ignorance, and we're, that's really what we're going to talk about tonight. But we see a priest um, sinning, we see the congregation sinning, um, and then we see a ruler sinning here, and then at the end we see the common people sinning. So we see these different categories of people that would bring a sin offering, but the thing I want to point out, the first thing I want to point out before we even get into the sermon, is that when the priest sins, he has to bring a, a bullock. He has to bring something very serious. But when the common people sin, he has to, they have to bring a kid of the goats or a lamb. They, have, they can bring a lesser offering. That, that's just to point out that it is more serious when a priest or a pastor or a ruler falls into some kind of sin like that, especially what we're going to talk about um, this evening, a sin of ignorance, because um, these are all sins of ignorance, by the way. Okay, that's, that's what really what we're going to talk about tonight. But the point is that if a, a pastor, as we talked about this morning, of an independent church would, you know, fall into some egregious sin, it's a very serious thing. It's much more serious. Why? Because it, it, it damages many more people. That's why. So it's the same thing with a leader of a family, a husband who falls into some sin. What, why is that more serious? It's more serious because of the fact that it will influence the people that are following that spiritual leadership. So I just want to point out that there is a level of seriousness there that is implied in what is to be brought as the offering. Okay. So what are these offerings for? Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. You're going to keep your place in Leviticus chapter 4. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10 and keep your place in, Hebrew, in Leviticus chapter 4. I'm going to read the first couple of verses of Leviticus chapter 4 as you're turning to Hebrews chapter 10. It said, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning the things which ought not to be done, and shall do any of them, any of what? Any of the commandments of the Lord. So that's what this is talking about. You know, I'll often go out soul winning, and I will explain to people, you know, when, when the Bible says, for all have sinned, and I'll say, like, a sin is a transgression of the law. Like, you've heard of the Ten Commandments, right? And most all people have heard of the Ten Commandments, though you are seeing more and more that have not, which is a little scary. But the Ten Commandments are just Ten Commandments. There's hundreds of commandments in the Bible. There's hundreds of things where God says, don't do this, do this. Anytime we go against any of those, it is a transgression of the law. So the Bible here is saying any of the things which ought not to be done, and if you do them, and then it says, if the priest that is anointed do a sin according to the sin of the people, let him bring for his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. And look at the last verse of, the, of chapter number four. It says, and the priest shall make an atonement for his sin, talking about the common person that he hath committed, and it shall be forgiven him. So they're going to do this, this offering of a, of a bullock, of a kid, of a lamb, depending on who sinned 
the sin without knowing, and it is to make atonement, is make is not atonement, is to make it so they're forgiven of this sin. But this forgiveness, uh, look at Hebrews chapter 10 to explain this. This forgiveness is not forgiveness as far as forgiveness unto salvation that most people would teach. This is talking about, yes, it is a picture of, of what is going to get us saved in the future, the sacrifice itself, but it's just like confessing your sins today. You know, just as in 1 John um, chapter um, 1 and verse number 9, where it says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible is, we're talking about having a good relationship with your heavenly Father here. We're talking about, you know, receiving, getting right with God is what we're talking about. All right, but look at verse number one of Hebrews chapter 10. Now, the, what, these, what these sacrifices, all the sacrifices did not do, including the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16, is actually, for, you know, actually atone for sin. That's why I, I, I caught myself when I said atone there. Because the sacrifices of the animals did not atone for sin. They were simply a picture. I don't want to give it away for you of the actual real atonement to come right. through the blood of Jesus Christ. You say, why do you say that? Look down at the Bible in Hebrews chapter 10. It says, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. God is having these people do these ceremonial things to picture the coming of Christ, to picture the actual atonement that is about to come. And not the very image of things can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should not have more, no more conscience of sins. So the Bible here is saying is these sacrifices did not save people. These sacrifices did not atone for people as Christ atones for us. They were simply a shadow of things to come. They're a picture of what God is actually going to do. Because it's saying if it was just like the blood of Christ, the, the blood of these sacrifices... It would only need to happen once. We wouldn't have to do it year after year after year or every time you sinned ignorantly in the case of tonight's sermon. Look at verse number three. For in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. God is just having people remember. He's just having people be aware of their sins, get right with him, make, you know, make restitution with him. Look, confession of your sins is something that should be done on a daily basis by a Christian. You should be aware of your sins and you should be confessing your sins on a daily basis when you pray. Do you pray? Look at verse number four. The Bible says, for it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So what these people, I mean, there it is right there. You know, there it is right there. The, what these people are doing in Leviticus chapter 4, it did not take away their sins. It's just them getting right with God, them doing this, this ceremony, this sacrifice to picture the coming Christ that whose blood would take away their sins, whose blood would cleanse them unto salvation. So all that to say this, they're not getting sin atonement here. These people doing the sacrifices are simply looking forward to Christ as we look back at Christ. And of course, the, the sacrifices, if you keep reading the next verses in Hebrews chapter 10, the sacrifices are done away with because Christ is here. Christ came already. So as soon as Christ died on the cross, the sacrifices were not necessary anymore. There's no need to look forward to it because it just happened, for real. One sacrifice, once and for all. So tonight, I want to focus, that's all just a preface to the sin, the sin offering here. So the sin offering, you see this, these, um, this word come up over and over in Leviticus chapter 4, and again in Leviticus chapter 5, but you see this, these, this phrase, um, this phrase or this word ignorance come up again and again. And these sins are all sins of ignorance that these people are bringing a bull, bringing a lamb, bringing a kid to make, um, make things right with God and, and throw, showing that shadow of, you know, Jesus to come. So you say, sins of ignorance. What does that mean? It means they didn't know they were doing something wrong. It means they were doing something. That at the moment they committed the sin, they didn't know it was wrong. And then later on, they find out 
that it's wrong, and they're like, oh, I've made a mistake. I've committed a sin. You see this again and again. There is no sin that is covered in Leviticus chapter 4 other than sins of ignorance. Are you shaking in your boots yet? Because the Bible does not cover sins that people know are wrong, that they go out and just do them in Leviticus chapter 4. So sins of ignorance are what are covered here. So I want to break down the idea tonight of what is the difference between sins of ignorance and sins, uh, you know, sins that are on purpose. Or I'll show you how the Bible, you know, looks at those, you know, how the Bible characterizes that type of sin in just a few minutes. But I want to break those things apart and see is one worse than the other tonight. So first of all, we need to attack this false doctrine going on today. Turn to John chapter 19 that, you know, some sins are, you know, all sins are equal. All sins are not equal. All sins are not equal. The idea is stupid, but it is taught everywhere today that all sins are equal in the eyes of God. People just totally take James chapter 2 um, out of context and teach this false doctrine. Look at John chapter 19 and verse number 11. The Bible clearly teaches in many different places that some sins are worse than other sins. And then we need to understand this before we can go forward with this idea this evening in Leviticus chapter 4. Look at John 19 verse 11. John 19 verse 11, Jesus answered, or Jesus answered and said, Thou could have no power. He's talking to Pontius Pilate here. Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. He's telling Pontius Pilate that the people that delivered me up, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, he's like, they're in a lot more trouble than you are. They've done something way worse. How could there be a greater sin if all sin is exactly the same in the eyes of God? There's clearly a greater sin. Look, that matches our conscience too. That matches the conscience that God gave us in our hearts because obviously murdering somebody is not the same thing as stealing a candy bar or something simple like that. I mean, that makes no sense at all. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Look, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense that all sin is equal and the Bible teaches that all sin is not equal. Look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 16. Because again, like I said this morning, the Bible actually makes sense. The Bible actually matches your conscience. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. The Bible says, If a man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. So there is a sin. I mean, then it literally says, There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So the Bible says that, yeah, all unrighteousness is sin, but there's a sin that requires capital punishment, and there is one that does not. He's saying there's, there are categories of sin. Not all sin is equal. Turn to Matthew chapter 23. And thus, not all punishment is going to be the same because all sin is not equal. Look at Matthew 23, verse number 13. Matthew 23, and verse number 13. The Bible says this in Matthew 23, 13. It says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them, them that are entering to go in. He's saying, you are stopping people from going to heaven, is what Jesus is saying here. He says, woe unto you. Woe, what, what did we see this morning? Woe unto the pastors, right? Woe is when God's mad at you. Woe is when God is bringing down, you know, judgment upon you. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. So here we see that God puts the false prophet, somebody that is literally leading somebody else astray, in a greater peril. They're going to, look, they're going to receive greater punishment in hell, is what this means. They're going to receive, look, they're all going to the same place. All saved people are going to the same place. But depending on the wickedness that they did in their life, they're going to be judged by what? They're going to be, in Revelation chapter 20, the books are opened, and, you know, them, they stood before, you know, the dead stood before the throne, and they were judged by their what? They were judged by their works. What's the point of judging them by their works? All you would need, if there wasn't a greater damnation, in Revelation chapter 20, all you need is the book, the book of life. That's it. Saved or unsaved. It's a one or a zero. But the reason they're judged by their works is because there will be a greater and a lesser damnation. Look, it's all hell. It's all bad. But, you know, 
Somebody like Stalin is in a much worse place than, you know, Joe the, the, you know, the construction worker down the street that just didn't care too much to hear the gospel. Hell is hell. It's a terrible thing to even think about. It's still eternal torment, but there is a greater damnation. What does that look like? I don't know. I'm never going to know. Unless I ask Jesus and he tells me when I get to heaven. But I don't think I'm going to want to ask that question when I'm standing, you know, with Jesus in heaven. But the point is there is a greater damnation for greater sins. All sin is equal is clearly, it is nowhere in the Bible. And it makes no sense at all. Look, even for, even for everyone on earth when God was in charge, there is, there is greater punishment for different sins. There's greater and lesser punishment in the, in the Bible, in the King James Bible. Okay, we've got to use a King James Bible because it gets weird when you get into the new you know, Bible versions, but capital punishment, like it is literally, there's literally a death penalty in the Old Testament when God was in charge for cursing your parents, adultery, you know, lying with a beast, homosexuality, incest, rape, death penalty. In the King James Bible, you have to get married in the NIV. It's weird stuff. Stealing men, slavery, men stealing in the King James Bible, death penalty. In the NIV, it's fine. I mean, all the new, a lot of the new Bible versions like condone slavery. That's why people are like, the Bible, you know, condones slavery. They're like, yeah, which Bible do you have? Servitude and the modern idea of slavery are completely different things. But that's another sermon in itself. But turn to Exodus chapter 22. So we see the death penalty for a whole slew of things in the Bible. But what about stealing? What about stealing? Look at Exodus 22. We're just talking about civil law. We're just get, kind of getting a, a preview. You want to you have a preview on how Jesus is going to run things? Just look at the Old Testament. Look at Exodus chapter 22, verse number 1. If a man steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. So if you steal from somebody, I mean, doesn't this make a lot of sense? If you steal from somebody, you have to restore, you know, so many times what you stole. I mean, if somebody steals, I mean, first of all, if somebody steals today, we do nothing, like literally nothing to them. So what happens? You get more stealing. But the Bible here is saying that if somebody steals an ox from you, then he has to give you five oxen. I bet you there wasn't a lot of oxen theft. Because then you end up with people that are in great debt. And if they can't pay, what do they do? Now they're in servitude. See? That's how servitude works. Because if they can't pay money, if they can't pay oxen, they still have their labor. They can work it off. It's totally fair. If somebody steals your car, throwing them in prison does nothing for you to get your car back, to get restitution. The Bible just makes sense here. Exodus 21 talks about literally the difference between murder and manslaughter. The Bible gets this detailed. Look at Exodus chapter 21, verse number 12. It says, He that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death. Somebody that murders somebody. But it says, If a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, then shall take him from mine altar that he may die. So the Bible is saying, if you plan to kill somebody, like I'm going to go kill this guy and then you kill them, you're executed. You get capital punishment. But then the Bible is saying, like, if, a man, if you, you didn't mean to do it, you didn't mean to kill him. Like, you didn't mean to kill somebody. Like, this is somebody that goes out and gets in a fight or does something, you know, um, negligent driving, like a drunk driver or something. They didn't necessarily, you know, get into their car and try to kill. Well, drunk driving maybe isn't a perfect example. But somebody that did not mean to kill somebody but ended up killing somebody anyway, this is where the refugee cities come in. And, yes, there is punishment for it, but we're talking about manslaughter here. We have the same types of systems today. Somebody that got in a fight and, 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 you know, with somebody else and accidentally killed that person, they didn't necessarily mean to kill them. It was proven that they didn't mean to kill them. It's called manslaughter. That's what the Bible's talking about here. Different crimes, different levels of offenses, different levels of punishment. Back to the sermon. Back to the sermon. That's, that's just a real quick overview of all sin is not equal. There's clearly different punishments for different sins in God's government. 
And look, while we don't follow it today, that's how God is going to run things in the millennial reign. And it must be right. Turn to Luke chapter 12. So, back to the sermon. We're seeing in the sin offering that the sin offering, whether it be the priest, whether it be the people, whether it be the common man, or whether it be a governor or some sort of ruler, it is all for sins of ignorance. So the Bible here is going to show you tonight that sin, sins of ignorance are not as bad as sins that you are aware of. Okay, look at Luke chapter 12 and verse number 47. You say, prove it. Well, look at this. Verse number 47 of Luke chapter 12. The Bible says, let me let you all get there, Luke chapter 12 and verse number 47. Note while I go through this that Leviticus chapter 4 only covers sins of ignorance. You say, well, what about the other sins? Look at Luke chapter 12 and verse number 47. It says, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. So the Bible here is saying that this is a guy that knew what to do. This is a guy that knew what was right, and he did not do it. He will be beaten with many stripes, verse 48, but he that knew not. This is Leviticus chapter 4 right here and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomever so much is, much is given, of him shall much be required, and to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Now look, this is what I need you to see tonight. If you take nothing away from this sermon, this is what you need to take away from. Committing sins that you know are wrong are, is much more serious than committing sins that you are ignorant of. And if there's, look, I'm going to tell you what the problem is with this church right now. You say, what's the problem with this church? I'll tell you what the problem with this church is. The problem with this church and why people will fail is because of the problem I'm going to tell you with this church. Because if you get in this church and you get into a Bible-preaching church and the Bible is being preached to you three times a week and you are, you are, you are reading your Bible... You're in your Bible, because that's one of the things I will be telling you that the Bible does tell you to do, is study to show thyself approved. Thyself means you, not me. When the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, study to show thyself approved, it's talking to the reader, the person that's reading it, that's you. Every time you open your Bible, every time you come to church, every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, your list of ignorant sins will go down and down and down and down. That's the problem with this church. Which means when you learn the Bible and you refuse to act upon it, it would be better for you if you had not known. That's what the Bible is teaching here. It would be... And by better, I mean you would be receive less punishment from the Lord. See, people that are hearers of the word only will simply not last in the Christian life. What do I mean by that? I, I don't mean that you will cease to be saved. I mean that people that are hearers only and do not act upon the words that are preached, that they read, they will not last as disciples. And instead, they will, they will be, you know, God will try to purge those people, as in John chapter 15. He will try to purge that branch and purge those idols out of your life, those idols in your heart, those idols in your life. God will try to fix the problem. But you, you eventually will quit. If you take nothing from the sermon, you must take this. Turn to Numbers chapter 15. Look, after one year, after two years, after three years, whatever it is, you will quit. If you hit a wall, and this is exactly what happens to people, they hit something in their life. They hit a wall. They hit something where they're like, okay, yep, I get that, I get that, I got all this stuff, and I get that. Not doing that. They hit that wall, and you know what? It will... It will stop, it will stunt their growth. At some point in their growth, in their growth if they decide, I'm not going to do that, this will kill the Christian life. Because eventually, folks, everything becomes known. The commandments of God are going to become known to you. 
if, if you listen to the Bible? What is the other kind of sin? And what is the seriousness of it in the Old Testament? Look at Numbers chapter 15, verse number 24. It says, Then it shall be, if ought be committed by ignorance, ought meaning sin. Again, what do we see here? Ignorance. Without the knowledge of the congregation, that all the congregation shall offer one young bullock for a burnt offering. Sound familiar? Look at verse 25. The priest shall make atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them. For it is ignorance. And they shall bring their offering and sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord and their sin offering before the Lord for their ignorance. Again, ignorance, ignorance, ignorance. And it shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel and the stranger that sojourneth with them, seeing all the people were in ignorance. So the rule, if there's a stranger, again, just showing that, you know, Genealogies mean nothing. If some foreigner comes and, and follows and accepts the Lord and follows their traditions, like the rules are the same for the stranger. Another sermon in itself. And if the soul sin through ignorance, then he shall bring a she-goat of the first year of the sin offering. This is talking about the common man, the individual, and bring a goat. And the priest shall make an atonement, verse 28. You shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. This is the person that immigrated there, that accepted the Lord. But look at verse number 30. But the soul that doeth ought, this is talking about sin, presumptuously. That is the opposite of ignorance. This is the person that goes and knows something is wrong and does it anyway. Now he has to bring two bullocks. No, let's keep reading. Whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. There's no sacrifice. There's no sacrifice for it. You know what? This perfectly matches the New Testament. This perfectly matches the New Testament. Turn back to Hebrews chapter 10. I should have had you keep your place there. There's no sacrifice for the person that goes and knows something is wrong and just does it anyway. Are you, are you taking account of yourself this evening? How many sins that you commit during the week or during the, the month in your life or whatever it is, how many sins that you commit do you know that they're wrong? Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number, let's just start at verse number 24. So notice in Leviticus chapter 4, there is no sacrifice for the sin that is done presumptuously. The person that knows the sin's wrong and does it anyway, there's no sacrifice. They're just cut off. There's only punishment, is what the Bible is saying. Look at Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, let me rephrase that, if we sin presumptuously, that after we have received the knowledge of the truth, this is why Leviticus 20, or verse number 4, or, or chapter 4, does not have a sacrifice for this. There is no sacrifice for a presumptuous sin, a willful sin. If we sin willfully after we, we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. This is why God doesn't have the willful sin covered in a sin offering. You say, why? Because there is no sacrif more, more sacrifice for sins. Applied to us, Jesus isn't going to come and die for you again. Jesus died once. That's it. And you're trampling the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ by willfully sinning. This is why Leviticus chapter 4 is only about ignorant sins. It's picturing that Jesus Christ is going to die once. And there is, look, there is no, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So what is there then? Just punishment. That's it. A cer but a, cerful, a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. Oh, hell, it's, it's it fiery. It's talking about God's mad at you. God is upset with you, and there's go he is going to judge you on this earth. He is going to punish you. He's going to chastise you, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall ye, he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. That's a pretty serious accusation right there. You know what you're doing when you sin willfully? You are trotting underfoot Jesus Christ. That's how God looks at it. 
God looks at you just taking for granted and treating the, the sacrifice of his son as nothing, as something that you would just walk over and have no respect for. And have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctifies an un, sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Does it say the spirit of grace goes away? No, it says you did it. You're, you're taking advantage of God's grace is what he's saying. He's like, by sinning willfully, you're taking it, you're trotting Jesus Christ underfoot, you're counting his blood for nothing, and you are, you're taking advantage of the grace that you've been given. You're taking advantage of the promise that God has given you that he will give you everlasting life, eternal life. He will seal you and never take it away from you. For we know him that says, vengeance, vengeance belonging to me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge the unsaved. No, the Lord shall judge his people. The Lord shall judge the saved. The Lord shall punish the saved. It's the only option he has. He's not going to take away your salvation. He's promised you eternal life. The only option that he has, and why Leviticus chapter 4 only covers sins of ignorance, is because there's only punishment if you sin willfully. That's it. And again, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. This is bad. It's bad to sin willfully. So the point is, back to the only point I wanted you to take away this evening. The attitude that you need to have as a Christian, especially a Christian being in a church that preaches the Bible, the attitude that you need to have is you have to sell out. That is the only winning way. You have, to, you have to tell yourself, if it's in the Bible, I'm going to do it. I mean, it is, the, it is the people. It is the people that are saved, and then are in, and then they're out, and then they're in, and then they're out for a while, and then they're in for a while again. Look, these people have nothing but pain and suffering. And they will not be, I'm, I'm telling you, somebody asked me this question about two weeks ago, and people will not be in this in and out um, area very long. They will, either, they will either get in or they will stay out. Because that in and out, that's a painful place to be in the Bible. It is a painful place to be to have, you know, those ignorance, that ignorance taken away when you're just not going to do it. You're saved and that ignorance is being destroyed. The ignorance is being erased. And you're just not going to do any of it. You're not going to stay there and listen to that much longer. It's just going to be pain and suffering. I've had, people to say, I've had people say this to me out soul winning. You'll know if people say this to you, you'll know you did a really good job of explaining what eternal security is and what God's chastisement means. So I've had people get saved and say, uh, I think my life's going to be quite different going forward. And I'm like, exactly. It's going to be different. It's not going to be the same. You're not getting away with stuff anymore. You're either going to get right or it's that fiery indignation coming towards you. That's why I always tell you, you just have to be this type of person to be successful in this Christian life. You have to be this type of person that just says, if it's in the Bible, I'm going to do it. That's it. That's why I'm like, turn to verse number whatever. Don't take my word for it. Look at it yourself. That's what I'm saying to you. Look. You know, I mean, that's why there's only backwards or forwards in the Christian life. There's no cruise control. Because as you read the Bible, the ignorance is going away. The ignorance is going away. The ignorance is going away. And if you're learning and you're not doing, you're going backwards. If you're learning and you're not implementing, you're going backwards. But if you're learning and you are implementing, you're going forward. There's no cruise control. There's no like, hey, I'm just going to keep it right here because the ignorance is being destroyed. And what will happen is you hit that wall where you're just like, yeah, but I'm not going to do that. And whatever that wall is, it's, it's different for, I've seen it. Different for many different people, but it destroys their Christian life all the same. When you hit that wall, then you know what? Bitterness sets in. 
And you know what? Then what people do is they, they want to shoot the messenger. And here's another thing that you need to understand and, and you, know, you need to take away from this evening is sometimes I ask my wife when I know I have to preach something that is, is kind of a harsh message, sometimes I will ask my wife after I preach the message because my wife is much more mercifully minded than I am. I'll, let me, I'll just say that. But sometimes I'll ask my wife, like, how do you think that um, you know, I'm aware that I've preached harsh, me harsh messages before. That, it's not lost on me. I know that. But sometimes after I preach a message like that, and by the way, as a rule, as a rule, if you're sitting in a church service and you're hearing a message and you're just like, oh man, he's preaching against me. As a rule, I will not preach a sermon against one person. If there is something going on in the church and one person is doing it, I'm not going to get up here and write an entire sermon for you. If it's a major problem, and look, there's no problems like this. This is preventative maintenance, all right? But if there is something where you're sitting there and you're saying like, oh, that's about me and, and all this and this is harsh. First of all, it's not just you if I'm preaching it from the pulpit. But all problems need to be addressed because guess what? I'm responsible, not you. I'm responsible for what happens here. But again, people shoot the messenger because they're like, oh, that was too harsh. That was too harsh. Let me just say, no two men would deliver a message the same way. That's the first thing you need to understand. And if there is some problem in the church that is, you know, going through the church, I am going to preach on it. If it is an issue that is spreading through the church, you had better believe that I am going to stand up here and preach on it. And I have, and I will continue to. And sometimes it may sound harsh if it's serious. There's nothing like this happening now. And nothing like this at all but it's happened in the past and it may sound harsh but there, you just have to ask yourself this if you're like man this is harsh this is really you know hitting hard you, pastors being a meanie head you just need to ask yourself is it true you need to kind of forget how the message is delivered because again no two men would deliver a message the same way you probably don't know the things that I know you probably don't know the seriousness of things that I know, and many times I can't tell you. But what you have to understand is just, just follow that rule. If you hear something, you just ask yourself, is it in the Bible? Is it true? Yeah, meanie head, but is it true? Is it right? Is it, what he's saying in the Bible, is it biblical? And if it is, implement it. It's that simple. I mean, I don't want to be any harsher or sound meaner than, than I ever need to be. And maybe I should be meaner at times, and I sh should have been, I was too mean in another time. Just ask yourself, is it in the Bible? That's the only thing that you need to do, and that will solve all those problems, and it'll keep you moving in your Christian life. It'll keep you moving. But look, it's a big deal to be sinning willfully, is the message tonight. And if you sin willfully, you get two points in the Bible where you're just like, I'm not going to do that. It has the, the biggest risk is it has the risk to destroy your Christian life. And if it destroys your Christian life, where are your kids going to end up? I mean, this serious stuff here. Many of the consequences, I believe, just from my short experience, but many of the consequences where people have destroyed their Christian lives... Many of the consequences they don't even see because they're going to be generational consequences. And they may not personally see them if they're super hyper-focused on themselves anyway. So it's a very serious thing, so much so that it is not even mentioned in Leviticus chapter 4. And the people were just put out of the congregation in the Old Testament. And Hebrews chapter 10 exactly backs it up. Sin offering is for ignorant sins only. And our list of these sins, folks, is going to be shrinking every single day. Here's, here's my last point. Here's my last point. As I just talked about being harsh and just being, you know, all this. We need to also understand that while a mature Christian, basically being a mature Christian means you know what's in the Bible, you know what's in there, what's not in there. That's our, that's our religion. What's, what's it mean to be an independent fundamental Baptist? If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not, I don't. That's it. So, understand, though, that as people come to the church, they visit, they just get saved, they come into the church and they start becoming a disciple, that not everyone is going to be at, at the same stage 
of knowing, you know, what, you know, of being ignorant and not. Maybe you've been saved for many years. I've, I've known people that have been saved for decades and are still very ignorant. <laughs> but, I mean, maybe you're a mature Christian. Maybe you know what the Bible says and you're ignorant about very little. You have to understand that people that do come in here new are going to be ignorant about a lot. So we need to, what am I trying to say? We need to show some mercy. That's why in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse number 11, where it talks about the six sins that literally can't be involved in the, can, that can't be in the church, we're going to kind of show mercy there because it says, if any man be called a brother, meaning somebody that's in the church, that's getting connected, that's selling out for the church, but if they hit their wall on one of those things, that's not going to work. See? And where is, that, where is that point where that needs to be corrected? Well, that's, that's my call. And look, we've done that. But the point is, we just need to show mercy to people that are growing in Christ. That's all. So it's very serious to sin willfully against the Lord. And we're all, we're all <laughs> getting to the point where when we learn the Bible, we read the Bible, we study the Bible, we're going to know exactly what God wants and he doesn't want. And if we continue sinning, it's, it's all going to be willful sin. And it puts us in a dangerous place as a Christian. So make sure that... You're just, you just put yourself in that mindset like, hey, you know what? Here, just, just accept this. I accepted this a few years ago, many years ago. Everything you've ever been taught is wrong. You're like, that's a tough one to swallow. Just take that pill right now. Everything you've ever been taught is wrong and everything that's in here is right. And just undo everything and just start from scratch. And you'll be much better off and you won't have any problems in this Christian life. So that's the sin offering, talking about ignorance, ignorant sins, which doesn't apply to us that much, I would say, because we know the Bible at this church. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.